We're in Luke chapter 22. If you're joining us late in the game, so to speak, we have been teaching through, I've been teaching through the book of Luke for many, many, many weeks. And so we only have this message and one more before we actually finish up the book of Luke. All of those messages are available online, so I'd encourage you to, to look at those if, if you have interest in, in seeing kind of the progression of, of how um, we went through the book of Luke. Today we're in chapter 22. The message is entitled, Jesus the Lamb of God. There are many uh, connections between the work of God in the Exodus, because this passage talks a lot about the Passover meal. That's what's happening in context here. And it also talks about Jesus, the Lamb, who takes away the sins of the world, ultimately. And so we'll do a little bit of comparison and contrast of those two ideas, tying the Old and New Testaments together, the story of the exodus of the Jews uh, from Egypt and the story of the exodus that we have from our own sin and brokenness because of the, the blood of Christ. This chapter specifically speaks and gives us understanding. Uh, so again, in context, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is close to being crucified. This is the day and evening that will ultimately bring about the the Lord's Supper and understanding of of the Passover and and the the sacrifice of Christ. So this is about to happen in in the unfolding story of Christ. He's been teaching in the synagogues. He's been sharing truths with people around town in Jerusalem. Um, the Pharisees and other religious leaders have been pushing against him and trying to refute and rebuke him, and they don't like his influence. They don't want him to, to get the people all charged up and excited about um, these things because it, it kind of steals from their authority and from their place. They're looking for all kinds of ways. They haven't yet been able to trip him up in the story. And so now they, they take some other approaches, and of course we know the rest of the story, but here we're going to consider Judas and what it means. So We can often look at the betrayal that that Judas performs on Christ of of giving him up to the authorities, and and we see that as as such a terrible, terrible thing, and it is. We should see it that way. But we also need to understand the flip side of this. If God is sovereign, then everything that happens is part of God's sovereign plan. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. Because the world in which we live is broken. So God is not surprised by the brokenness of our world. And the sinfulness of man, the brokenness of our world, is why Douglas, El Paso, Dayton, it's why these kinds of things happen. It's why disease exists. It's the sinfulness of humanity that causes this brokenness, which means evil is present in all forms. But even in the midst of that, God is still on his throne, and God is still ultimately good. And we we often have a cloudy vision when it comes to that because we don't fully understand the bigger picture. Typically what that means is we've placed ourselves, which is natural, in the center of our worldview. This is not beneficial to me, therefore it must not be beneficial, versus Maybe I'm not supposed to be the center of my worldview. What if Jesus is the center of the worldview that's biblical, and then if it's for his glory and his honor in some way that we can't see, it will then bring us to understand and make sense of, ultimately, in the view of eternity, what God may be doing and how he may use these terrible circumstances for his glory. So with that, let's look and consider Judas in this early betrayal. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad. And agreed to give him money, so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the crowd. So the first thing we come to understand is that this betrayal, number one, was prompted by Satan. I think it's critical that we understand the nature and the foundation of evil in our world is birthed out of a rebellious angel, Satan. 
who was at one point very close to God, but then sought to be God. He was cast out of the presence of God and now lives and works in opposition to the goodness of God. And so sin has entered the world. The thing we, I think we come as a takeaway, will come as a takeaway from this is that Satan is real. I think often we, we are lulled into a mindset that doesn't see a real Satan. And part of why we view that is that we often have a, a worldview about people that says people are basically good, but some of them do bad things. That's an unbiblical view. The Bible teaches that people are basically bad. And no people do good things in and of themselves. The goodness comes as a result of God. Ultimate goodness. It doesn't mean that lost people can't be kind. That's not what I'm saying. Of course they can. It doesn't mean that lost people can't do some nice things. But ultimate, eternal good things can only be done by those who are in Christ. And those who have been changed by Christ because he is the one doing it. So, Satan is real, and we need to be aware of that. Jesus is opposed by Satan, no surprise, and Satan seeks to destroy Jesus. So Satan influenced and ultimately controlled Judas so that Judas is willing to to move in this direction. So what's the application we have? Well, an application to, to walk away from this with is that we are called to fear God. We've read the book. God wins, Satan loses. Often I think there are people, even spiritual people, who look for Satan under every rock and nook and cranny. And they have this great fear of all things evil. Here's what I would say. God is not calling us to ignore Satan. We should be fully aware of him at all times. But our fear should be placed on the one who has authority over Satan, God. We know that because of the crucifixion, if nothing else. There, Christ died, and then he rose again. Not even death, Satan, the author of death, not even death could keep Jesus. So we see that God is more powerful. So we're called to fear God. It brings wisdom and life and hope in the future. And we're called to resist Satan. But we resist him because we are following after Jesus, um, not because we are fighting him directly. The Lord can fight our battles and, and that is exactly, we sang about it earlier, but that is exactly the posture of a Christian, to place our trust in the one who will never leave us or forsake us. His name is Jesus. And now we see in verses 7 through 23 that this whole event, this whole understanding of the betrayal of Christ was predicted in Scripture. It was prompted by Satan, and it's predicted in Scripture. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. So in verses 7 through 13, we see that the temporal fulfillment of observing the Passover, any good Jew who was remembering the gracious work of God in the exodus from Egypt would remember that in part they were spared their lives because of the covering of their doorpost by the blood of the lamb. The death angel would then pass over them. You can read that story, that intriguing, amazing story in the book of Exodus and see 
God's handiwork there. And so each year, there was an opportunity to remember by way of this Passover feast and meal what God had done in grace. And now, Jesus is taking this and using it as an opportunity to teach a greater lesson, not just of temporary safety, but of eternal safety, which will culminate on the cross. And so we see the temporal fulfillment of observing the Passover, but we also see the, um, the view of the end of the world. Now, the last chapter, we looked a lot at the end of the world and what that means. The theological term for this is eschatological fulfillment. It gives a picture of the end times in that first it was the, the then, the Passover, the now, he was instituting the Lord's Supper, and we'll experience that together in a few moments. He was instituting the Lord's Supper, but he was also pointing to the future when he talked about he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the time that he would return. This is a picture of the marriage feast with the Lamb when he comes again to bring us to himself. And so there's a, there's a present and a future understanding of what God is doing in this as it moves toward the end. And then there's a picture of Jesus very simply in this, or a Christological viewpoint that is given here. And this is the, the Passover in Egypt, which really becomes a foreshadowing of the Passover lamb of glory on the cross. So the blood on the doorpost turned away the angel of death at that time, but the blood shed on the cross turns away God's wrath from sinners who received that for all time. And so this is a picture of the permanence. And again, as I've already stated, the good, the bad, and the ugly, even the betrayals of Scripture, are all part of God's sovereign plan. He works through tragedy to accomplish our salvation. And we see his story unfolding in that way. Next, we, we move into an understanding that this betrayal doesn't have the last word because in it we see that Jesus purchases a kingdom. He purchases a kingdom. Look at verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greatest? One who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now the point he's making is, yes, there is a kingdom coming. Yes, there is a day when you will be considered among those who are great with me in the kingdom, all those who know Christ, but not yet. Right now, and there are numerous passages that teach this truth, you will suffer. In fact, we know that for the disciples, pretty much all of them were martyred for their faith. And so it was not a good day. First, it was a bad day before it became a good day. So, it's very much the same picture as being a Christ follower. When you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, it is an immediate, life-changing, transformative situation. And, and you can announce from your soul, because of the, the joy and presence of God in you, I have been changed by God forever. I am already a child of the King, you can say at that point. But you still have to live life on earth. And earth is messy and broken and filled with sin and disease and dysfunction. But what God does sometimes is he gives us a little taste of what it may be like in the future. But it's only a taste. So you'll, as a Christ follower, maybe you'll have a, a run of goodness. I mean, when if you're married, there are no arguments at home. Like you... You are amazed at how smooth everything is going. Life is good. You get a raise at work. Uh, maybe you had received some questionable health news and, and you get a phone call from the doctor and say, I'm so sorry we confused your records. It's not you. You're fine. Everything is good. Your children miraculously obey your every command without question. And for this season, you're feeling like, Wow, it's so good to be a follower of Jesus. Look what he's doing for me. And then you wake up, 
And then you see that you actually still do argue with your spouse. The children really aren't obeying you all the time. They're just acting like they are for other purposes. The doctor calls back and says, I'm so terribly sorry. We confused it again. You are actually the one. You don't get a raise at work. You get let go at work. And on and on and on and on the, the story may go. And so you begin to have this sense of, I thought that it was going to be better when I followed Jesus. But again, if your perspective is placing you in the center of that story, then you miss the fact that the better of the story is not for your glory, for my glory. The better of the story is for his glory. But there's a day coming when it'll be good for him and for us. It'll be wonderful. So, yes, we've already come to know him and been changed if you are a follower of Christ, but we have not yet arrived. There's so much more that ha we have to experience. And so this is the tension that Christians live in. It's the already, not yet tension. And we struggle with that. I, God has changed me, but I still struggle. Paul had a whole passage of scripture where he kind of went off on himself. I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. I sin, but I don't want to sin. I want to be holy. I'm, I'm holy at times, but then I sin. I mean, on and on and on, this passage went, and it's like he was beating himself up because he lived in this tension. That's where we live, in the already but not yet. But Christ has purchased a kingdom for us, and it is coming, and it will be beautiful and wonderful for all of eternity. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. <laughs> well, Jesus was omniscient, and he knew that wasn't true. And so Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what, Peter. The rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. And, of course, we know the story, and we know that that did take place. Peter denied Jesus. So we have this passage of scripture that's really talking about the, the, the betrayal of Judas toward Christ. And now we see a picture of Peter, this one who was so close to our Lord, believing that he would never, ever do anything wrong. I'll go with you to death. And yet he betrayed him three times in one day, early in one day. The thing that we see is that, and it's a beautiful blessing for us, is that this betrayal led to the sacrifice of our Lord, which ultimately means that he protects us from Satan. He protects from Satan. You see, Jesus is the friend of sinners. That's us. We're the sinners. We're the ones that need his protection. We're the ones that need his encouragement. His death on the cross gives us freedom from sin, protection from the accuser and the attacker who is Satan. And so the invitation is, come to Jesus. Come to the cross. It is there that God has meted out justice and has worked a plan where there was no plan for us to be spared from the wrath of God. He took that wrath himself. So he protects us from Satan. And then the last verse is 35 through 38. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, no, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he, has numbered, he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough little confusing, but the point I believe that Christ is making in those last verses that we're looking at today is that he provides a mission. Now, he's referring back to times that the disciples and others had, had gone out as witnesses and had taken nothing with them, and God had miraculously provided for their needs. And certainly, God still does that work today. But we have a different perspective today because we have the church. The church didn't exist at this point. It does now. We are the bride of Christ. We are the gathered group of believers who have resources, 
we have ourselves, we are resources in and of ourselves to share the truth that God has. We have prayer, which is an incredible resource that God has provided that we can approach his throne and ask for his intervention in any situation and plead with him to bring people to the truth, to change people, to deliver people, whatever the case, heal people. But we also have financial resources in addition to those other resources. And so now he's saying, take your money bag with you and use it because you're going to need it. I'm sending you to the four corners of the world. Take your knapsack that has physical resources. You're going to need those things. Sell the swords or the cloaks or whatever you have to have to have the resources to get to where you're going. That's really the picture. Well, here's the great news. Through the church, the Bible says it's through the church that the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. So we are, as a church, both individually, Park Ridge Church, and collectively, the Bible-believing church in the world, we are the vehicle. We are plan A for God. But there is no plan B. We're it. We are all he's got. He has chosen to use the church to accomplish his purposes. He does it through the generosity, the willingness, the courage, the faithfulness, the encouragement, the prayer, the truth that is spread through his people to the world. So when you give, some of that money, most of that money stays here for ministry locally, but it Portions of that money go literally around the world to make a difference. When you pray, those prayers are for this ministry and what God would accomplish here. But I hope that they are also for the changed lives around the world. Other churches locally, other communities around our nation, other nations around our world. And as we serve and as we go, because God will call some out to go far away. But here's what I want you to hear more than anything. He calls all believers to serve, all. We are all called to serve in ministry wherever he has placed us. Some he calls to leave and go far, all he calls to serve. And so I encourage you to find how God is calling you to serve to make a difference in our world so that we would lift him up. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to myself. Well, he was lifted up on the cross. That's how he was lifted up. And we have the opportunity to announce that he was lifted up through our testimony, through our lives, and through our influence on others. So that everyone would see Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray.